Always been a fan of horror films. When I was about eight years old, I think my brother showed me Friday the 13th 2 and John Carpenter's The Thing, and I was just completely addicted right off the bat. And that summer, I went to summer camp, and the counselors told us to stay away from this one cabin or else Hatchet Face would get us. And I was all into this stuff, so I was like, this is awesome, what's he gonna do? They just said, well, he'll, he'll get you. I'm like, with what? And they didn't have an answer. So um, that night when everybody went to sleep, I made up the story to the other kids because they were all whispering, do you think Hatchet Face is gonna get us? And I was like, yo, you know who Hatchet Face is? And like, he was this deformed boy and the house got lit on fire and the dad came home with an ax and all this stuff. <laughs> All the kids started crying and the counselors were gonna send me home from camp and they called my parents. And for about 20 years, I kind of sat on that story just waiting for this moment. But an eight-year-old really thought of this and I don't know what that means, but it worked. The hardest part wasn't actually making the film. The hardest part was proving to other people that you could make the film. Sarah Albert, one of the producers on the show, uh, was just so convinced that we could get this thing made that she convinced Adam and I to go to New Orleans with just a palm quarter and a brilliant idea to shoot a teaser trailer to create a whole package for this movie that we wanted to get financed and get shot. We were getting a lot of, oh, you can't do this. You've never done it before. Well, then why do you think you can do it? And so we said, well, let's buy plane tickets and let's all meet in New Orleans and let's go on a swamp tour and we'll get the footage and we'll do this. And it's funny because now I'm laughing because what's so great about that? But when you're that poor, like, it was an investment. It was like, all right, we paid for this. Like, we have to make this movie now because we had spent a few hundred dollars. And that was really when it became real. It was only intended to just prove to a couple of people that we do have the skills to be able to put something together that looks good. It was just like a regular alligator tour. And the whole time, Will is leaning over the side with his camera, and the tour guide's like, what are you guys doing? We're like, nothing, nothing, we're fine. We're just trying to get these shots that we wanted. Um, and then we came home, and we started putting everything together. but. We needed to tell the story of Victor Crowley, and we needed a voiceover for that. He wanted a little child's voice. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Victor Crowley. Uh, a friend of mine had uh, a young, had a son and a daughter, and I had asked him, you know, do you think that we would be able to come over to your house and record Eleanor? She was probably like three or four at the time. And she couldn't read, but her voice was just so amazing. And we sat in her room with like princess fairies, like painted all over the walls. Folks weren't too kind to Victor. Folks weren't too kind to Victor. And I'm just listening in the headphones thinking like, this is frightening, like this little girl's voice. And that was what we used. And even now in the theatrical trailer, like it's Eleanor's voice that we recorded off of a DV camera, I think in a little kid's bedroom three years ago now. We sent the teaser trailer all over the place and everybody loved it. Actually, when we were finished, there was crazy rumors all over the internet that the movie had already been shot and that's when we knew that we had done a good job. Somebody sent me a link and they're like, there's a horror website talking about Hatchet. And this guy, uh, Ryan Rotten, just for whatever reason had blind faith and went out on a limb and just said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get behind this one and call it real. And then all the other ones started calling it real. It was kind of promoting itself as a return to the slasher genre, and I was really excited about that since I'm a big fan of Halloween and Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street above all. And uh, me being me, I contacted the website and was like, hey, who are you and how do I know more? Being able to talk to Adam and Sarah and get updates on how things are going, it was a kind of a nifty way to bridge that gap between online journalist and filmmaker. Usually there's a big gap, and uh, they actually they embraced us. He's become a really great friend. We have a whole group of friends that just really enjoy making these movies and, and hanging out and support Adam and support Hatchet, and he's one of them. There's so many so many guys that came, like, I mean, Fangoria was great, Bloody Disgusting, Brad Miska over there, like, one of his quotes is on the actual trailer, and they just embraced it, and they got behind it, and they supported it, and they're really the ones that got the movie made, because 
even for the investors, I know it helped to say, here, just Google Hatch it and see what happens. It ended up selling the film and ended up helping us sell the film. The, the big thing that really made it real for me when we first got to, you know, everything was in place, Hatchet was going to happen, we were going to shoot it, was we got our production office. Staff will be in here. There's a refrigerator, a little sink, we'll have a coffee pot in there. Um, this is our coffee room, so all our coffee and facts and prayers and stuff will be in here. Um, we have a copy room? We do. It's amazing. You know it's legit when you have a copy room. Now, because um, once we got the money, it was kind of like, oh, now we gotta make a movie. And it's gotta be good. Someone give me money dollars, I could do it, I could blah, blah, blah. I was that guy until they handed me million dollars. And then we realized really, it wasn't really, enough. Really scared because it's not <laughs> enough. <laughs> I think the the first day that everybody was like, "Oh, here we go, we're on a ride," was our location scout. So uh, the other thing that happens here is after the two of them move up to the barn. I didn't realize how he had seen every. He knew every scene of this movie. This is all done in a lockdown wide shot where the edge of the frame is right behind our cast, who's standing facing this way up and down, backwards, forwards, every single angle, he had it in his head. Gets up, turns to run, and then boom, into Kylie's chest. He looks up, Kylie takes his head like this, so now our camera will be here. And you can see he's in his head and he goes, and then we'll have the camera here, we'll have the camera there, and we'll go down here. He's just a maniac. Back in 2004, Adam said, hey, we're gonna go out and meet Kane Hodder. So we went out there and Adam was, he was like a little kid in the car on the way over there, so excited he was gonna meet Kane Hodder. And I was asking Sarah and Corey, is it cool if I bring all my Jason shit and have him sign it? And they're like, no, no, don't do that. You gotta be cool, don't, don't be a fanboy. We talked about everything. I mean, I guess, you know, he had, you know, been, uh, I don't know, I'm not really a fan, I don't, I, for lack of a better term, of the stuff I had done before. And we just talked about the movie, talked about the character itself, and the fact that Beekler was doing the makeup. You know, it was all a pretty, pretty obvious thing that I would have to do it. Plus, you know, it's a character, granted it's in heavy makeup, but he also offered, uh, Adam offered the uh, incentive of playing that character's father in a flashback as myself. So, you know, I really liked that idea because I had been trying to do more, um, more characters outside the makeup as well. Even though I'll always like wearing the makeup, I just wanted to do, you know, something with my regular scary face. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for everything. This is wonderful. I'll see you next week. Bye. I don't know who I am right now, but, oh my God. <clears throat> yeah, that was cool. <laughs> He's all right, I think it'll work. Since it's gonna be fun, I got, you know, buddies in this, Tony Todd and Kane Hodder. Uh, you know, we, we've worked together before. I think Kane and I were on the cover of Rolling Stone together, so it's kind of fun to see all the old ghouls together, Candyman and Jason and Freddy. Tony Todd. What do you want? I went by the set of a movie that Beekler was doing because I wanted him to look at the budget for Hatchet. I said to Beekler, I'm like, how could we possibly get him to be Reverend Zombie in Hatchet? Because for Hatchet 2, that's a huge part. Um, he would be perfect. I have to go tend to my birds. So yeah, it was nice to reunite with uh, the Fab Three, I guess. And I had Jason, Freddy, and Candyman in my slasher movie. And it was great having all of us together, especially when I got to kill most of them. <laughs> yeah, so as far as casting goes, everybody came in, everybody earned their part, because everybody auditioned for their part, except for Dion. He, he called, he contacted me, and he was like, you know, I love your work, you know, I'm a fan of it, um, you'd be perfect for this role. But we didn't even see anybody else from Marcus, because I, I always knew it was gonna be him. It was a very fun process in the fact that clearly the majority of the audition scenes were the comedic elements of it. Uh, Perry Shen, when he came in, uh, he just had us. Yeah, it's this the gist of it. That's not even the house. Say, Bob, what are you... 
<clears throat> it was kind of like one of those best auditions that could, that could happen. You do something and the audience, I mean, the, the people who are there just laugh. And everyone, and they were just cracking up. And they were cracking up so hard that I was having to, to sort of take a moment because I was starting to crack up. And, uh, and that doesn't happen very often. And the girls would come in and they would do, or whoever would come in and do their audition. And afterwards, they'd leave, we'd say thank you. And I'd just look straight over to Adam and I would be like, do you, do you want to spend a month with this person in the swamp? And that's pretty much how we cast Hatchet was deciding on whether or not their personnel, like could they hang? Because we were going to be shooting at nights, in the cold, in the wet, in the swamp. And I was a good judge of character and I picked, I picked the people that I really wanted to be with because I was so picky about everything, especially um, the roles of Misty and Jenna. Because here you got two parts that require nudity. And granted, it's very funny nudity. Hey, who wants to be in the Halloween video? Uh, Come on, girls. It's not like it's these weird sexual situations or something. It's a parody of Girls Gone Wild. So he didn't really work for Girls Gone Wild? I'm thinking no. Dude must just pretend he's a producer to make his own little private collection. That fucking pervert! God, why are guys such slime? I can't believe I've fallen for that three times now. You know, it's always kind of an uncomfortable thing walking into a room with five people and you're by yourself and then, you know, but he made it really comfortable and we had other friends in common so he made me feel really welcomed. And I could just tell that he was very passionate and this is something that he had wanted to do his whole life and he had been waiting for the right moment. He was looking for the right people to play his parts. Thank God it was me. <laughs> I bet this means Shapiro was here. <laughs> what a genius. You do know the vibrator goes in your cooch and not your ear, right? Hey, why don't you suck your dad off again, bitch? I will, right after you're done. Fine. Good. <laughs> Good. Thank you, that was great. In That's real life, so neither one of them is like that. They're just like the sweetest girls you'd ever meet. And then Tamara Feldman, um, we had seen every girl in Hollywood for Mary Beth at that point. And they say that it was Victor crying for his daddy to help him. And they say that he still wanders around the woods at night with that hatchet across his face. And she just had this aura about her where she's so beautiful but you're afraid she might kick the shit out of you or something. And it was a lot of fun auditioning and we kind of just clicked in the audition room, you know, with Adam. I mean, I guess because she gets to kick ass and she gets to chase the monster, she's kind of fights back. We were seeing basically every guy you would expect to see as the leading guy romantic interest in a horror movie. And they were all coming in and they were good. And then Joel David Moore walks in. I'm like, is he gonna read for Ainsley? Because Josh Leonard already has that part. And she said, no, he's reading for the lead. And I was like, <laughs> Okay. And Joel starts, and by the time he was done, I was like, he's the lead. I'm like, that's the guy. Once he starts talking, you're just in love. He's so charismatic on screen, and just, like, you want to root for somebody like that. She tells me she needs space. What does that even mean in girl language? Space. Whatever. Get my mind. This was the perfect situation because I also wanted to play the title or the lead character in, in a film. So um, it, it was just, uh, it was beneficial on all sides of it, plus the fact that the script was hilarious. And I know there's horror purists who say they don't want any comedy in their horror movies. I don't really like that either. Like, but as long as you keep the comedy out of the horror, it's a different situation. And it sounds bizarre because this movie is scary and very violent, but the scenes that don't involve Victor are very funny, and the, the way they're written and the way they're performed. Come on, you freak! You look like you've been molested by wolves! I think it's just the reality of being scared is funny. <laughs> it's just hilarious. If you, if you really look at all the situations in all the old movies, it just wasn't anyone there to say, wait a minute, he's coming from that same room. Why are you going back there? What can you see from up there? I can see ain't no dead elephant man coming to get me. So it, it, I think he really grasped that aspect, which is the audience. They, we always did that for the movie. We always, what are you doing going left, right? I think he put the audience in the movie with, by using my character. So I think it's perfect. I loved it. I'm supposed to be here right now, man. Just be looking at some titties, man. What's wrong with us? Shit. And then you got the Joel Murrays and the Richard Reillys, who are just these classic actors. Well, what do you know, Lovekins? 
We've got ourselves a director over here. How exciting. What kind of movie is it? Well, have you ever heard of Bayou Beaver? Sure. No. no. That was the beauty of Hatchet, is the fact that it was a horror film, but it was also infused with 45 minutes of essentially a comedy that got pushed in and slammed into a horror film. I think he brought it back to where you can really be truly scared of the main character. You can sympathize with him a little bit, but even the sympathy makes you understand he's crazier than you know than you can deal with. You can't get any better than this. I mean, you know, the 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 characters are so rich and so funny. Everybody connects to them, you know. And Adam has that visual language. He knows how to generate a scare. He does. That's really cool. We're not in enough trouble that you had to scare the pants off everyone too. I think the way it is written, you do have sympathy and you actually care about the characters that are getting killed, and you might even have sympathy for Victor based on the story structure. Victor was scared to death of other kids. They teased him and tortured him like kids do. They were so cruel. You know, I was... Honestly, the first day of production was the first time I'd ever been on a film set. So I walked onto set, and it was, it was a, it felt like a big movie. We had, we everyone really got excited about this movie, so they took every favor that they had. In 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 my camera department, uh, we, we just had a great a great cast of people in the camera department um, that were just they were just hilarious guys that just had a blast being together, being on set. You can have like a whole section of the camera crew. We were bullshitting, we just blew a takedown on the second unit. <laughs> but see, we're against second unit, so what we did was just we're fighting them, see? Yeah, we're not playing, we're not real good team players, dog. <laughs> First unit right here. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> second <laughs> unit has the nicest ass here, all right? You know what I'm saying? So I chose to do the entire movie on Steadicam, and it challenged, it challenged my operator, BJ, immensely. And Adam came up with one shot he wanted to get in one take. BJ has to be holding the steady cam on some people, walking backwards to get the next one, forwards again. And I think we shot that almost 12 times before we got it right. And if you knew what it was like to hold one of those steady cams and walk backwards up a hill that many times, I mean, all night long he did it. And everyone felt bad for him to the point where I was like, why don't we just change this? Let's do it again, let's go. Okay. We're going we again, guys. Guys. Okay, we're we gonna go safe. again. And he's like, no, this is what you want, right? This is what, we, yo dog, we'll get a dog. I'll drop kick that shit if you say you're not gonna do this. And, um, and, and he got it. And it's one of the cooler shots in the movie. Cut! Yeah! That was awesome! That's That's a cut. You know, I'd, I'd take people aside and tell them what a great job they're doing. Because it wasn't like a big budget movie, so it was very critical that the lights went in the place that they would do the most work, because we didn't have very many of them. Um, so it was really, really challenging to work that way. And it was difficult, and we did have difficult conditions in trying to create a swamp in Los Angeles. Brian McBrien is a genius, and the stuff he can do, especially with greens, I mean, we shot this whole movie in the desert, and it looks like you're really in a New Orleans swamp. You know, I'd get to the ranch in the morning at like six or seven with my crew, prep, build, do whatever else, you know, changeovers for sets, and then I'd hang out with production until maybe 11 or 11.30 at night, and then finally go home, try and get a little bit of rest, and then come back and do it again. So it was a wild ride. I mean, we shot a swamp movie in the desert. So that's the first thing. And, you know, so that means it's really hot during the day, really cold at night, and then we shot the whole movie at night, night for night the whole time. We were on nights. It's a tornado! Can someone cue the rain, please? <laughs> We got rained on in buckets last night, and uh, it it set us back in a number of ways. And of course, every night I'm ripping pages out of the script. I'm not getting to do things the way I really wanted to. But um, you just, you know, any movies like that, you just got to get it done. Because of the time of year we were shooting this movie, we had to squeeze in an entire day of shooting into eight hours instead of ten. 
every day. And there was a couple moments where we had that, you know, it was total panic when the sun was coming up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Ty, come on, let's, what are we doing? Shoot it now. We gotta go. It was like my heart sank every time I heard that first bird in the morning. It'd be like, and then there'd be more, and then there'd be more birds, and then there'd be more birds, and it's still dark out, so we're still shooting, but I know it's coming. I know that sun's coming up. This is a suicidal schedule, and we are doing it. So it's really like we shot the whole movie in like 14 days. And a lot of the stuff in Hatchet ended up being one take because we had no time. So it was just, okay, shoot it, moving on. One of the hardest things for me as a cinematographer was there's, there's one scene here where we have to light Kane Hodder on fire. And, you know, he's a stuntman, he's used to that stuff, but it's always a very tricky thing when you're lighting guys on fire. Then we stay on the 135 and you get, like, face and hands and bashing into the walls. Whatever you can get, he's going to be moving all over. It's really not a difficult stunt to perform. As long as you're comfortable being on fire, it's just all in the, the preparation. Light him. like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's such a great scene. You can't tell me that I just burned this guy and now he gets put out by nature. you got to be fucking kidding me. Oh, just a classic moment. Cut! Cut! Check it! Oh, yeah! After a good take, he would just get up and scream and yell and clap, and the energy level was always there. And I think that the crew felt like they were creating something special. It felt like people wanted to be there. Yeah, this crew is um, unfucking believable and this movie's a hundred times better than it ever could have been because of this crew. Along the way, he was obviously very emotional about things that he wanted, and he was very passionate about things, and, and there's no lack of passion in, in Adam Green, not out about it. Yeah! Start again, start again. Cut! Cut! Yeah, I love you! Woo! <laughs> it's very draining on, on to shoot long hours and to shoot all night is very draining on a, on a cast, especially having to herd a a big cast of people to, to go through a whole a bunch of shit together is very hard. So we had just a great atmosphere the whole time and, and a lot of that was our anchor. There's a scene where Tamara Feldman needs to find Robert Englund and Josh Leonard dead in the shed. And I brought her up to where the shed was. And all I had was this little tiny flashlight and he's like, everything in here is real. Stay in here, do not come out until I come and get you. I don't care how scared you get. I don't care what happens, do not come out. Like he would bring pictures of my brother and sit there and, and have me stare at them and look at them and tell me stories of like a vacation that me and my brother went on or how he used to pick on me and just like do this whole kind of backstory thing that was usually you do for yourself, you know, but for him to do that was really special. The only thing I can see is what my flashlight is lighting up. So there's shit around me touching me and I don't know what it is and I just started bawling. We run up and we had the camera ready and the lights came on and she saw them dead all splayed out there and there's this carnage everywhere. And I'm like, all right, action, roll. And she just lost her shit. <laughs> and Joel reacts, and you expect us to cut, and it just hangs on her for way too long while she's crying, and, um, and I still don't really know why, because the editor in me is like, oh, you should cut earlier there, but there's just something about it um, that works. The producers did a good job in, in just delivering craft service and delivering heat lamps. All you need to make somebody happy is coffee, craft service, and heat lamps, and we're okay, because half of the time we're wet. And so we just run over to a heat lamp. Not all of us, I was a man, and I stuck through it. No, I was the first one over there. Oh, this is the first day here. for us, oh, and we're freezing already. Yeah. We're wussies. Dion did not like to get wet. Oh, they look... Oh, 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 oh people, oh. Dion! <laughs> Dion! <laughs> and he would make everybody stand in front of him. He would make everybody go first before he would get wet. I love that. I broke my rule today, I got wet first. 
<laughs> when they shouldn't turned, have done oh, yeah. that. Here's Dion wore a wetsuit in which I didn't. Dude, I've never worn a wetsuit, so I'm like, what does that, does that do for you? They're like, it keeps you warm, you know? And I'm like, I'll wear it. And everyone's like, no, I don't want to look fat. Fuck fat. <laughs> Fuck fat. I don't want to look cold. I'm calling him out right now. He wore a wetsuit, and I didn't. I'm not going to say any names, but you had men. Say, I don't want to look fat. And I got a cold because he's smarter than I am. <laughs> if I look fat in the movies, because I'm warm. <laughs> uh, yeah, joke's on me. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> double team, that was a double team. I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Adam, uh, I've been with him now the first two nights of shooting, and he, he gets it. And I think the crew likes that, and they feel like they can contribute a little bit of humor here and then when we're wading around in the muck and the mud and, you know, putting, you know, bloody dismembered organs <laughs> and dead alligators and things around on the set. You have to be a little loosey-goosey and, 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 and have a sense of humor about that. And Adam certainly is running the ship that way. And I, and I, I think he's got, a, he's got a long shoot ahead of him because we're all knights, but uh, I, I think he's steering correctly. Scare bus, scare bus, no boobs in here yet. Scare bus. Come on, guys, sing along. Rolling. It is a rubber gun, it's not real. Okay, it's a rubber gun. <laughs> it's rubber bullets. Rubber. Worst AD I've ever seen in my life, man. Worst director I've ever seen in my life. Okay, I only got about two of those. Now is the winter of our discontent. This will be thrown before this is over. Could very well happen. <laughs> it's, it's, it made it kind of hard to be serious some of the times because we would start joking so much. So I'm going to give this uh, this show a little bit of uh, quality, a little bit of intelligence here. So uh, come on, come on board with me. Everybody, yell poop and pee. Poop and pee. Yeah. That's some real civil rights shit. I'm in a tree and you hit me with a hose. <laughs> we had Pat Patrika cracking up and telling nasty jokes. And when you can get a classy guy like that to be able to <laughs> stoop down to our humor, oh, are you, you know something's wrong. So to keep things interesting on the set, we had all these little themes <laughs> during, the, during the shoot, and uh, one of them, Sarah Elbert came up with Mustache Day, which was, you know, we'd all, we were all pretty scruffy from a tough, you know, tough couple weeks of shooting. Um, I'm digging all the mustaches, and, uh, <laughs> and um, I'd really enjoyed the camaraderie of the crew. It's been great. Because nobody was going out in the real world anyway while we were shooting this film. We were just like, we were secluded and in, in the middle of nowhere. The camera department had helmet day once, and it was just them. <laughs> but they had helmet day one day. Where's fucking Lewis at with his badass helmet? You gotta get Lewis's helmet some shit. We kind of all like did little jobs along the way. Once we got settled and we knew what we were doing, we could kind of play a little bit, which was really fun. Mock. Rubber gun does not work. <laughs> rubber gun on set. <laughs> it is rubber, cannot fire, will not fire. Wow. Beat wow. into it. You gotta learn how to feather your fingers with it, kind of just touch it. Yeah, it should, it should sit. And action. And action! Today I was given the camera to do my own little documentary. I had people give me three words for uh, what they were, what their experience was like on, on set here. Mercedes McNabb never, never gave me the damn words. Come on, three words, three words, three words. I need your three words. Give me three words, three words, <laughs> no, three no. words, give them to me, no. give them to me. Three words. <laughs> Cocksucker motherfucker, go away. That's more than three. <laughs> the, the film is filled with 
with people involved with the project. Some shots in, in Bourbon Street, there's our first AD is ends up passed out on the street in the beginning during the credits. The, uh, the film's executive producers are in the crowd, you know, throwing beads and stuff. John Gross, who shot all the behind the scenes footage, is uh, one of the drunk guys in the gang at the beginning of the movie. And he's the best part of that whole scene. You, you threw up six times yesterday. How do you even do that? I wish I had picked that one as my cameo instead of the guy who actually has a line. What, so you can sit in your room and cry about Heather? The, the, my steady cam operator runs in front of the, the scare bus at one time. He jumps out of the way of the scare bus. Hey, what the fuck? Uh, Sarah Elbert, one of the producers, I think is throwing up in front of a, throwing up in front of a voodoo shop. <laughs> Lady. Oh, uh, welcome to New Orleans, or at least the, uh, the airport. Um, this is probably the last clean place you'll see for the rest of this trip. Basically, so what's happening right now is I'm wrapped for the day, but they need my professional bead throwing arm because I'm the only motherfucker that can reach up there. I got to It's the way I thought. It's like a hook on it. It's like a. I don't know. It's, but you'll notice all the beads that are actually making it there to the girls landing properly are all me. It's all technical. It's not just here to see boobs. Who wants to do that? I'm here for the reason. I actually got paid a bump for my arm. All of a sudden, we're there and we're shutting down Bourbon Street. Bourbon Street in New Orleans. That was crazy. And uh, and we're recreating Mardi Gras. And I just thought, oh my, what are we doing? Are we really doing this? This is huge. Adam Green, can you please report the camera? Adam Green. Can't, you know, cameras, police cars everywhere. And, you know, Adam and I standing in the middle of the street shooting our movie, you know? It, it was pretty amazing. Uh, we, we stopped many times, kind of looked over, and just like, this is. This is messed up. <laughs> I can't believe we're actually doing this. But it was amazing, amazing feeling to see the whole the whole city shut down for us. And just walk out on the street and just be like, hey, look, I'm here. <laughs> I'm shooting a movie. I don't think we were supposed to get that much leeway on the streets of New Orleans, but we did. And it was really sticky and hot whenever we, we shot in the swamp. We shot up and down the streets and around uh, neighborhoods. It was just a skeleton crew that went down to New Orleans. You know, there was only a couple of us. And we had no gear. And the shot was basically what Adam wanted was he wanted the camera right on top of the water. You know, and this boat was going to be moving and he just wanted to have the, the, the camera like just flying right over top of the water and panning back and forth, seeing things. And To get that shot, um, uh, BJ, my steady cam operator, literally had his feet dangling in the water and the camera like an inch from the water's, you know, surface. I just told him, I was like, look, man, I'll take my shoes off. I'll sit on this little pontoon and I'll put the camera as close to the water as I possibly can and just have one of the grips hold me, you know, right off the right off the side of the boat. And the swamp, I mean, this is all in New Orleans, so, you know, we're in the total swamp. There's real alligators. This is like, I think it was an alligator farm we were shooting at. When the boat was moving and we were doing the shot, it was fine. But as soon as they stopped the boat, they're used to coming up and I guess people would feed them marshmallows. Okay, throw a marshmallow down right in front of it. No, 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 oh, wrong way, wrong geez. way. Oh, sorry. And that's the only way to keep the gators from coming towards me when we were like reloading a mag or changing a lens or whatever. Punch it, punch it, punch it. Now he was like this far, man. He's looking at your toes, dude. This was kind of kind of freaky. I was waiting for that Jaws moment of the one gator under, like underneath me just coming up and grabbing me and pulling me down. Jesus Christ! You know, so it was it was pretty wild. It was, but we got the shot and it was cool. Okay, everybody, I have an announcement to make. That is a picture wrap on Edge. I feel good. I'm going through the Bayou in New Orleans or in Louisiana. Yep. Um, we 
had a great crew, we had a great time, but we got it all done and we got the movie made and uh, we made a good movie. Until that shitty director screws it all up in editing. Finishing the movie, there were a lot of challenges even after the shoot that we're all we've all been involved with. So you have the you know you have pre-production, production, post-production. Post so it was it you saw the movie unfolding as you were there every day from scene to scene, and there was all kinds of debate over the music cue when the bus is driving through New Orleans. We wanted to lull the audience sort of into a false sense of like this is going to be a fun adventure, you know, and, and sort of like. Everybody on the scare bus, like the Promatios and everybody were, you know, they, it was all bright eyed and, you know, wonderment and like, wow, we're in New Orleans and gosh, this is going to be fun and we're going to see some ghosts, ooh. And it's my favorite music cue in the movie. I would never take it out in a million years. And that's exactly what I told Andy to do. And at this time that we're doing this interview, I still have no idea what's going to happen with the theatrical release. Like, but it doesn't matter at this point. Like, it was, we made it and we did it, and we think it's a good movie, so we're proud. I find the best experience that I've had, I've had um, are on uh, lower budget or slash independent uh, films. It's been, it's been really a blast. It's an incredible group of, uh, of people, both the cast and the crew, and it's been just a lot of fun. I've been a little cold, a little wet, a little cold, a little wet. Uh, have you enjoyed getting wet? <laughs> hey, oh. I couldn't have asked for a better cast to work with. It's been a kick. We had a great time. It's been amazing. It's been terrifying. It's not just another Gator movie. I thought we were making a romantic comedy. I didn't. What? And they pulled the blood out. Probably the most enjoyable uh, movie I've done for a variety of reasons. <laughs> Couldn't have been better. There's no plan. Actually, I'm afraid it never will be better. That is very scary. Like, what if this is the, what if this is the pinnacle for all of us? Like, what if it never gets better than this? So everyone's just gonna have to come back for Hatchet Two. People really weren't getting paid all that much. It was a low-budget movie, and people didn't want to leave. It, we would wrap production, and they would want to all go hang out together, and they wouldn't want to go home. They really felt like people felt like they were creating something special, and they were happy to be there. As, as hard as it was, it was such a blast. I mean, it was the most incredibly grueling 28 days that I've ever had to endure. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm also so happy that I did it because uh, it's just such a wonderful experience. The people that I met, I still am really close to. And every day that I pulled up and I saw all those trailers lined up, I just, and, and these huge cameras and cranes and sets being built, and just was like, this is our movie, this is for us. I'm not an extra here. I'm not uh, an assistant on set. This was our movie, and it was incredible. If you have the right people, you can do anything with your friends, and you can do anything if you really believe in it.